This is Duke University. I, I remember a time when um, I think you asked me the, a question at the end of one year, how the year went for me. Yes. And it was actually a, wonderfully, a wonderful mentoring moment for myself. And um, it, if you, you probably remember, but I was very proud of myself that everything worked uh, that right. year. I was right. so proud that I accomplished right. everything. And, right. and you actually were, were frankly, uh, disappointed yeah. <laughs> because if everything worked, it was it was too uh, simple. The questions were too simple. Right. It wasn't bold enough. Exactly. And it was a tremendous lesson yeah. for me. And I remember telling you about how at the end of every year I make this little chart yeah. of uh, how the year has gone, different activities, right. and what I plan for the next year. Yeah. And then a year later, I go back and I look at it and I sort of see how many things have worked. And I remember right. telling you that. My sweet spot is I like to run around 30%. 30% right. is working, 70% is failing. Yeah. If I get to 50%, then my feeling is I'm taking it too easy. Right. I'm pleased to report it's currently about 20%. <laughs> uh, so. When I began in research for almost the first two years, uh, I met with only abject failure, yeah. which I did not handle well. Yeah. But at least it taught me some lessons about how to deal with such kind of failure. Um, I've observed uh, in your meetings, um, generally throughout the whole, the whole laboratory, there's this air of playfulness. This there's this air of positivity. No yes. matter how bad things are going experimentally, <laughs> right? It, it's always good, right? And um, why do you do that, right? And I, I do it for several reasons. One, uh, obviously, it's a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, and I think people, uh, and you know, I tend to be pretty humorous most of the time. I have a humorous outlook uh, on life and on, on most things that I do. But people do their best work when they're enjoying it and when they're having fun. Uh, I'm always interested in what the sports figures, basketball yeah. figures have to say when they're being interviewed. Yeah. Sometimes after uh, if there's a bad stretch and things aren't going well, they'll say, you know, if things aren't gelling, we're just not having fun anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, you want to have fun. The other thing is I really do believe that humor is a source of creativity. Mm -hmm. And the more people laugh and look at things <clears throat> with an offbeat perspective, uh, which is what humor is. It's right. basically, humor is basically seeing some relationships uh, that you might not otherwise have seen right. and realizing, hey, that's kind of funny if I put this and that together Neither one alone is funny, but you juxtapose them all of a sudden. Well, it's, research is much the same way. It's seeing associations and this kind of thing. So uh, humor, as you've noticed, is a big part of, first of all, it's a big part of my personality. Yeah. But it, it, I think it really, what you say is true. People in my lab tend to be upbeat. Uh, they see the humor in things, and they're always ready to have a good laugh. But then I think it really, creativity flows from that. We uh, recently had a program project grant committee meeting yes. that uh, we have a grant together and we spent the first hour as we often do uh, just talking about different aspects of research and one of the things that came up was serendipity in research. Yes. So, so many experiments are done by people in the laboratory and sometimes they're, they don't work out, right? The, post, right. the postdoc or trainee, a graduate student may do the experiment and sort of a little embarrassed to show you. Right. How do you make sure you see everything? in the laboratory because even though it didn't work, there could be a real discovery in that Absolutely. experiment. And it's something I And think they wouldn't recognize yeah, it. We all struggle with that. Uh, and I try to stress to them, I don't only want to see no. the experiment that worked because uh, danger lies there. Yeah. Because if they only, I mean, to take the limit case, they did an experiment 10 times, five times it worked, right. i.e. showed you what you wanted want to, to see. see, five times it didn't, they only show you the five that showed them what they wanted to see. So I'm always asking, were there other experiments? Does it always work like this? The mentor-mentee relationship should be a very, very special yeah. relationship. Yeah. I mean, you share uh, a lot of things in the course of several right. years, a lot of failure, yeah. and if every once in a while you have some modicum of success, it's just a wonderful. See, sharing that experience is what's so important right. to me. Right, yeah. It's remarkable that over the years, I think we've talked a little bit about this, that people have tried to make uh, or prepare documents on how to mentor. Right. You'll often go to you know, the NIH or websites and they say, well, this is the, this is the, the script for mentoring. But you don't do that. No, and I don't think you can. Uh, I'll give you an example. 
I pride myself that I am considered by most a very good mentor. Yeah. Now, as you know, I share the Nobel Prize with Brian Kobilka, in turn a former trainee of mine. Right. He also has a reputation for being a terrific mentor. Yeah. Now, you know us both. Right. You couldn't imagine two more opposite personalities, right. Exactly. right? And by definition, we have to mentor in totally different ways. Right. Because we're just two Very opposite personalities, right. okay? But we both seem to get the job done. Yeah. So what that tells you is there isn't one way to mentor. Right. I mean, you, so I, if there's one rule of mentoring, I would say do it in a way consistent with who you are. Right. Just be authentically you right. uh, and try to maximize uh, you know, your abilities as a mentor. But in terms of the rules, I don't put a lot of stock by, except when I'm writing, you know, grants where they say, how are you going to mentor? Right. Oh, then you they're, they're lay it very, all out. It's a, right. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. Right. Exactly. I've always struggled a little bit what translational research is and what it means. I'm pleased, frankly, that if you make a basic science discovery that somehow is related to disease process, I would call that translational research. Right. Others uh, believe that you need to be doing touching a human to do translational right. research. Do you have a yeah? I do. About I do this? have some feelings about that. So, in general, I tend to think of, of uh, and of course, there are all categories are arbitrary. And, and when, as soon as you start making categories, they're of course going to phase. It's part of a continuum. They're going to phase one into the other. But I, I tend to think of research in sort of three buckets: basic scientists, translational scientists and clinical scientists or patient-oriented research scientists. So patient-oriented research scientists or clinical scientists to me is easy to define. Yeah. I forget who I heard this from, but it means you can shake hands with your experimental material. Right. Okay, so that's, that's clear. At the other end, there are basic scientists, right. and that's what I consider myself. So these are people who are trying to understand some physiological or biochemical process without any immediate concern about its therapeutic or clinical application. Right. Just trying to understand. It. And then there are people, to me, the translational researchers are ones who are focused on either a disease or fixing something clinical, right. okay? And they can work anywhere. In general, they'll work, do, they could do basic research, but a lot of it is animal work, et cetera. Now, but they do blur one into the other. And someone like myself, who is a basic scientist, can do translational right, research. Sure. And I think one of the wonderful things about being a physician scientist is that you do have this integrated understanding of human biology. Mm -hmm. So almost invariably, anything you discover is going to have some clinical, therapeutic, right. pathophysiological significance. It's just a matter of understanding the biology enough.